This video looks at the meaning and uses of drawing within two particular areas of professional practice, craft and surgery. Following research into drawing and its impact on interdisciplinary learning, researchers at Brighton were keen to find out more about why and how some craftspeople and surgeons draw as part of their professional practice. What could these individuals tell us about the relationship between drawing and thinking and drawing and knowledge. Chris Rose and Donald Sammet are highly experienced professionals in their respective fields. They volunteered to take part in a filmed, unscripted conversation where they could explore their interests in and conceptions of drawing. They met for the first time at the location for the video and began to investigate how they each approach drawing, using both dialogue and live drawing to exchange and demonstrate their ideas. Rather than trying to present conclusions, this video opens up issues and questions to be investigated further. I've been, perhaps we could do that. If I showed you that thing that we do, right. then you could draw my hand or something. <laughs> so one, one thing we do is, um, I'll pretend to be the student at the same time, just if there's a group of people who say, I'd like you, oh, you often do this when they're not expecting it, they're expecting a seminar to do with art history or something. Yes. Uh, before we do that, you know, I'd just like you to get a piece of paper and, and draw a hand. And that most people tend to do um, something like this. Um, okay, that's a hand. And then, well, one thing is, it's a Homer Simpson hand. Yes. And then, so then you say, okay, I'm going to ask you to draw a hand again, but I'm going to give you strict instructions and you're not allowed to do any drawing until I finish telling you the instructions. So the instructions are you set yourself up in such a way that um, you can draw a piece of paper and you look at your own hand, this is the student looking at their own hand, and you tell them to take their eye like Greek vision, you know, to imagine a line going from your eye to the edge of the hand. And to allow their eye to follow the edge of the hand around very slowly and take your time. And to do that, but to um, just start allowing the pencil to follow the same movement that the eye's doing. And the, the key thing is they mustn't look at what they draw. It might be wrong in the sense of being an accurate picture of a hand as an object, mm -hmm. but it does have properties that are to do with character and individuality and observation, yes. which have been abstracted mm -hmm. from the process of making a drawing as a kind of product. And there's a number of other things you can do like that to do with it's trying to establish the difference between knowing what something is by recognizing it through a symbol, which yes. is very fast and studying something through observation. So there's a kind of real-time process of observing. Well, I mean, that's one of the differences. I mean, that's come from within, and that's come from without. Mm. You really produce that by looking, by observing. By that you've produced out of your image and something. Yeah, yeah. What is interesting about this to me is that up to this point, you're actually really in proportion. And then you start to lose the proportion. Yeah and your thumb looks like a thumb. Yeah. So in other words, what is interesting is that had you drawn that in isolation, that would look like a really good thumb. It's the rest that spoils it. Yes. And the other interesting thing is the proportions, right? Look at that. That web space is exactly right. Yeah. Exactly there. And the third thing which surprised me, when you let go the paper there, and you wanted to rejoin this line, you did it really accurately. I don't know how you found, how you landed on the same run. <laughs> you weren't looking. So th there are some really interesting yeah. mechanics of this exercise. Really? If you had to ask, so let's say, 100 people to draw a hand like you've just done here, yeah. and then take another 100 and ask them to do this exercise, these would all be individual. And yes. Those would really meld into one sort yeah. of image. You could almost superimpose them if you got the enlargement just right. Mm -hmm. And they more yeah, or less yeah. match, won't they? So, from within, as you say, is a, a shortcut. Turn it over and let's relax now. Like that. 
In other words, let the fingers relax. Um, I do this a lot before I start operating, really. And I'll, I'll do this before my operation, and then I'll, I'll draw my operation on it. Yes. Um, that's the thing you saw. So if I was operating here, yeah. I would then, for example, draw the incision there, which is what you saw earlier. I'll show you this. Yes, yeah, incision. Is that a frightening word? Yeah. No, well, I've been to so a lot of woodwork shop. I've seen people do a lot of unintentional incisions. <laughs> well, that's repairable. This is living <laughs> tissue. So they would be an incision. See, on this, this is my operating sheet. So yeah. I wouldn't write an account. This would be what I my account. Yeah. And then I would draw what I found inside, in this case a wall of bone, which is being removed. I see. And there it is being removed, you can now see the cavities left behind, and yeah. the further resection I've done. And then how I've stabilized the base of the thumb, using this sling of tendon. Wow. So you see, that's that's a standard operation in hand yeah. surgery, it's called a trapezectomy. But I give a copy of this to my patients, they take it away, the GP gets it, and the physiotherapist gets it, and there's notes in any doubt what's being done. Yeah. The, the other useful uh, aspect of this is I, I travel and work in Nepal in the yeah, so that I don't see those patients again. Yeah. So they all get, I, I brought this for example, was the like portfolio of the last trip I made. So each person gets a drawing and they take that away and it stays in the archives of the hospital because I yeah. may not see them yet. So that tells me or tells anyone. Yes whether he understands English or not, what I've done. Yeah, so the drawing uh, is a kind of universal, um, it connects to different levels of expertise and the patient, even if they're, even if they're illiterate. This is a very important thing we find um, these days. One of the challenges in, if you think about art and science students, who are generally people who have an extended visual way of thinking, they might be less interested in things to do with language and mathematics, uh, sort of in a knowing way, mm. they might be interested in maths, you know, uh, subconscious tools. Yeah, but one of the things um, is this issue of them downloading images from from the web, which uh, images they haven't taken themselves, and saying they use those images as inspirations. And what we try always to emphasise is that if you've been there in that place and you've taken that photograph or you've made that drawing yourself yes. in that moment, you are connected to everything about the reasoning or that experience, how it impacted you, what yes. you want to remember about it, because you yes. did this action. Yes. So there's an embodied form of memory that's extremely powerful and exactly as you said, as soon as you do something to remind yourself of that moment, all of that complexity comes to your to the fore. To the yes. fore. 
there's a, a, an anecdote about that, a related experience that is, if this is important in a sense to draw it. Even though I've always loved drawing ever since being a child, there was a thing I did about 15 years ago for, it so happens that Brighton and Hove has um, a lot of historically significant Victorian wooden shop front buildings, beautifully made, mm -hmm. original growth timber, very fine section, beautifully detailed shop fronts. The local council was trying to stop people rip these out and replace them with aluminium shop fronts. So they wanted to create a design guide as to how to do it properly. And there were so many of these things, 20 of them, they wanted me to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the guy who commissioned me said, surely there's some computerised way you can take photos of these things and just convert it into a drawing. And being a combination of sort of courageous and a bit stupid, I said, sure, yeah, that's why I can think of a way of doing that. And I found some software that automatically drew around the edges of things in a photograph. However, I took these photographs and squared them up so they were orth orthogonally correct. And I put them through this software but instead of getting a drawing of the, the framework and the door and the lintel and the windows, I got the edge of all the flaky paint. In perfect detail, flaking paint, dirt, everything but the thing I was looking at. And it was only when I did that that I realized that drawing was a knowledge-based activity. And it wasn't about drawing just the edges of what you were looking at. You were drawing be behind that that, those appearances, you were drawing the knowledge of the structure. Sure. So I think what you're talking about in the drawing, not only do you have a generalized knowledge of this highly complex structure, but you're also making a kind of autobiographical, or no, a biographical signature of that time, oh, of yes. that person, all in that single image. Yes, and in fact, the archives of notes that I, I never see them again. And yes. I yeah. Many people would turn up in hospitals where I'd work. I saw the drawings because the patient has returned and they'll see my. And it, it's, there are all sorts of other side issues to this. When I, I treat children, for example, you know, kids walk without the thumb or stuck fingers, and they put their hand there and I'll draw it and they'll keep it there. And there's always a moment when this six year old is looking at that and looking at, looking at his mother thinking, mm. so should I approve? And there's always a moment when they start to recognize their own hands, oh, yeah. the characteristics and their sort of smile, their mother. <laughs> and that must seem like magic to a child. Of course it does, yeah. Is they, yes. And also their life, you're extending their conception of their existence outward from their inside here. The fact that yes. it gets out there on the page is very magical. Yes. Because one, again, that's another, I haven't thought about that, that's another way of, because there's a sense a knowledge about the person that spreads outside the boundary of the person into this neutral zone, you can relax about somebody talking about what they're going to do to it. It's not always, in, it's not well, invasive. Yes, I haven't talked about that. I mean, that reminds me um, also of, I remember going to a lecture about head and neck cancer, and people have tumours inside their heads, and the, the person who started the lecture said, just get this. Your head is where you live. He said, if you have a pain inside your head, it's at the very core of your being. You can't say, my hand hurts or my foot hurts. I hurt. Mm. And that happens in reverse with hand surgery. You can, as you say, you're both of you looking at the same object. But the other side to it is that your hand is how you express yourself and how you deal with and mold the world. Um, there are all sorts of um, investments in the hand, and not to mention even the special categories like the musicians and the yeah. professional sportsmen yeah. who I treat, who deal with the world purely through that, they express themselves yeah. through that. Um, so it is, you, you're looking at a very prized object, a very prized part of you, mm -hmm. which is almost irreplaceable. And it's interesting that you can look at it in a detached way and as you say, as soon as you draw it, I mean I don't know if you can recognise the proportions of your hand in this, but yeah. it's your yeah. hand. Yeah. Um, and I mean because I draw hands all the time, it's interesting how actually they, they have the characteristics, it's like a portrait. Mm. I mean one of the, 
very basic things you get across to any junior hand surgeon is how your hand is as important, say, as your eye in absorbing information from the environment. Yeah. But unlike the eye, it's got an executive function as well. Yes. Yeah. This is what you dialogue with and what you do and affect your environment with. Your eye can only receive. You may think the eye can transmit, but what you're talking about there is the eyelids and the muscles that muscles yeah, yeah, especially yeah, not the eye. There's one thing I just wanted to mention very briefly, which I, I found very interesting, is the um, drawing and writing in the East and West evolved differently. But in the in the East, if you do um, calligraphy, um, there's an, an up and down movement that affects what marks made on the page. So you get this delicate. If you imagine this is got ink on. Um, you get this kind of delicate touch and you, there's a behaviour of the brush. There's rolling it, there's squashing it, there's doing all these things to it. So there's not only the XY movement, there's also the up and down movement. Mm -hmm. And then in those traditions, the sort of Japan and China, um, their writing and drawing stay very close together using the same implements. A brush can be used equally for both. But for us, writing and drawings diverged and, mm. and evolved different instruments and doing different things. But presumably, um, oriental scripts on paper would use a pen to find uh, Traditionally, they would. A lot of um, a lot of Japanese calligraphy uses. That's not a very good one. A sort of pen tip, uh, a brush pen. Yeah, yeah. Brush pen. They have little tiny ones that are very precise. Yes. So. Um, you, you know, you get this kind of, yes. you get a more animated line. Yes. It's very different to drawing a line with a pencil. Well, you can alter the colour of that one. With, yes, I, I yeah. feel I do that sometimes because even with these pens, you see, I'm, I'm very light there. Yes. And I could easily turn it into that. Yes. So, as you saw. So there is, there's plenty of emphasis. Exactly. That. And initially, that's why I like warm ones, because you can draw a ghost. Yes. And then you can yes. decide which of that, I mean, what yes. David Hockney calls groping for the line. Yes. Um, I'd also think um, drawing is so interesting. The different, you know, try that. Different kinds of um, material, whether they're uh, charcoal. You know, it depends on the size of the drawing. You, you can have a freedom and speed if you use a charcoal, so you get a bigger scale thing, but with the ease and fluidity that you get with a small drawing of a pencil. So but, um, but just this is reminding me about there's a, a sensuous side to drawing. For example, one of the things that I love about this is the sound that pencil makes. Yes. As, because really at its most basic the drawing is um, I don't mean to be pseudo poetic here, but it's your thought brushing the paper and leaving a thread of trace. Yeah. And this is your instrument. Well the doing the doing of it is, is the thing. These days I can't go anywhere without a pencil and pad at a restaurant or anything because it, I actually find that I think about things. The other, I don't know whether you do this, but something we, because I'm working sometimes with science and arts working together, it's about how concepts get mapped out um, in drawing processes. So one of the things about how, how cognitive processes work is that we have this facility for linear organisation, linear sequencing of it. We're creating a taxonomy of things in, in whatever degree they're laid out. And we also have the capacity to do this sort of more recursive process where you, you make excursions out in the middle and mm -hmm. come back, so you go out and come back, go out and come back, and you always come back to this notional middle area. Yes. So these two things working together appear to have a crucial relevance to the way we make sense of experience, that there has to be both a time-based way of understanding things that happen to us, you know, if this happened before this, so it creates a sequence, mm -hmm. but there's this other thing where things that you notice that are the same in character, like you must notice things, that there's some character or characteristic that you're solving in somebody's hand that you've done before, there was a different day and time and place and a different person, but there was something about it that was the same. So, you, is that, would you say that? Yeah, well, it, 
I was only smiling because you, you hit something which I thought only surgeons knew. <laughs> it's, it, it, you're right, actually, and particularly in anatomy, everyone has a different way of remembering things, but you do have concepts of, for example, big beefy muscles and they have their own yes. characteristics like a school ground bully, you know, playground yes. bully, or yes. fine... Do you think about those all, time, those all the time? Yes, all yeah. the time. For example, there are tiny muscles in the hand here called lumbricals. Lumbricals. L-U-M-B-R-I-C-A-L-S. Lumbricals. No, without E. And they are rather unique because they arise from a tendon and they insert into a tendon. They don't, oh, really? they don't go into bone. And don't start me on them. They're oh, my favorite the subjects because this it's all about muscle? the biomechanics of the hand. A muscle, I'll show you. The muscle, show you. The tendon. In the finger, look. So it conditions the tendon? It sort of synchronizes, yeah. So here's a flexor tendon, which goes all the way to the end bone, okay, the distal mm -hmm. phalanx. Yeah. And here's your extensor tendon. Yeah. Now here are interossei, which are muscles which are between the bones here. Yeah. And which then go on with a tendon to the other bones, these ones, the phalanges. But this tendon actually has a muscle attached to it. Mm -hmm. And it goes to this tendon. Wow. And part of its function is to synchronize the two actions. Yes. And the reason... Yes, like, um well, when it doesn't work, your hand behaves like a puppet's hand. If I, if I want, if this were a puppet's hand, mm. and I wanted to make this flex, mm. and I attached a piece of string here, and I pulled on it, this would flex fully, and then that would flex fully, yes. and then that would flex fully. But if you flex your fingers, they all go in together. Don't they? Yes. And yeah. one of the ways that's achieved is when this muscle pulls, Instead of bringing this down fully, that is slowing it down. Yes, See, so, it. so you're handicapping the joint which would otherwise be maximally flexed. Yeah, that's the, base, the base of your thumb has got what's called a saddle shaped joint. Yeah. Okay, so this fits on it, this bone fits on it like that. And the advantage of that is that you can go there and there, and you can go there and there, and anything in between. Yes. It's much more complex than that because it's cleverer than that. I'm a chap called Kapanji when he said it's true that it's a saddle shaped joint like this, but if it is, it must be a saddle for a scoliotic horse because if you draw a horse from the back, from the top, and like this, and it's scoliotic, the saddle is going to have an angle to it like this. And the reason you work, scoliotic, can you explain that? Scoliosis is when you have a bent spine or a yeah, curve. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. in this case, it's got a curve to it. Mm -hmm. And the reason it has a curve is, look at my thumb. As I lift it, watch the nail. Mm. It rotates yeah. to face the fingers. Yeah. And so because that has got, got a purpose for doing that. It's a, it's called, that's called opposition, because you're opposing those yeah. fingers. It's a conical movement, isn't it? It's works. a spiral. Yeah. And it becomes a spiral because of this scoliosis here. It's a, it's a, it's a horse with a bent spine. This is the, the entire history yes. of furniture from the medieval period through the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries through to 19th century and the present day, modernism, 60s, <laughs> in one page. 